This week marks the 50th anniversary of the release of the Oscar-winning documentary Let It Be. And I caught up with a guy who might have to become an interview regular because the resume is long. Author of The Roof, the Beatles' final concert available on Amazon, Grammy-winning record producer, and once the manager of Apple Records U.S., which is what I wanted to chat with him about today because Ken Mansfield is one of only a handful of people on the planet who can say he was on the rooftop of Apple Corps in London on January 30th, 1969, staged for the documentary when the Beatles performed live together for the last time. Ken, what a pleasure to talk to you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Before we get to the rooftop performance, now, you were in on the ground floor, so to speak, of Apple Records when the Fab Four came to you while you were at Capitol Records, as I understand it, and asked you to be part of the team to launch Apple Records worldwide. Why did they come to you? Well, I had worked with them originally in uh, 1965 when they came to California on their 65 tour, and I was the uh, district promotion manager at the time, so I was a young guy that, uh, you know, had the uh, suntan and the Cadillac convertible with the house with the pool up in the Hollywood Hills. And this was the first tour, I think, they did where they had a day off in California. And they really wanted to uh, know more about, you know, the surf scene there and where Grumman Chinese Theater was and Mulholland Drive and all these things. So they asked me to come up to the house with them and spend the day by the pool. So now I went from being a capital employee working with them. I also ended up becoming a, a friend that day. And so they came back in 1966, the second tour. I worked with them again. And I thought, you know what? I think I'm going to end up working for this band. I don't know. I just have a feeling. Well, okay. Two years go by. I haven't heard a word. So I go, well, that was the end of that little fantasy. But in the meantime, I had really moved up through the company and uh, was a top executive at the company by that time. And they decided to set up Apple Records, so they came to America. And I was included in, because of my responsibilities at Capital, I was included in all the meetings in you know, L.A. about uh, Apple being distributed by Capital and, and uh, how we would launch the thing. So when they went back, uh, actually, Paul came over. Uh, Paul McCartney, by the way. Oh, and, thank you. And Ron, Gass, the, the president of <laughs> of Apple. And when they got back to uh, London, they called the president of Capital, Stanley Gordico, and said, uh, we'd like Ken to come over and, and uh, help us set up the label over here and plan the launch in America. So Gordico and I went over there and spent uh, about a week, just most amazing week of my life. First time in London, very close quarter with all four Beatles, being shown the London scene and hanging out with them individually and, you know, just really a great time. And so I come back and uh, then they called Gordico and said, uh, we would like Ken to be the U.S. manager of the label. Uh, and what I did is that I kept my office in Hollywood and I would go back and forth between London and, and just use, you know, an office in uh at the Apple uh, building, three solid little row. Well, okay, so now we've covered uh, you in London for the first time and uh, the Beatles up at your place around your pool. Uh, see, those are two fully separate interviews that we'll have to get to at some point. But um, okay. Because that stuff is fascinating, too. Now, there are pictures, I believe, that I've seen of the Beatles in California hanging around a pool. That was a place that uh, they'd run up on Benedict Canyon, I think. Okay. Yeah, and it had a wall around it. And uh, Mal, that's the first day I met Mal, too, Mal Evans, and uh, he would spend his time because the address got out he would spend his time walking around with a water hose and <laughs> hosing down the wall if people would come over the wall like they were attacking you know in a war or something <laughs> he would just stand there and hose, hose them down as they came over the wall and then uh, security would ex escort them out but oh it was a pretty God. amazing day. and he was on hose duty so you weren't uh, <laughs> i mean you had established this relationship with the the beatles you weren't just a suit on the other side of the pond you were a trusted insider ultimately so what was it like dealing with the four different personalities in the band in those last years as things started to get rocky? Well, it did make an, an extreme change from the first time I worked with them, because in 65, they were really, I guess, uncomplicated, you could say. They were more lighthearted, and things were more fun. And, and uh, in uh, 66, when they came back, I noticed a, uh, a change. It wasn't quite as light. It was just uh, something was heavier, and the thing I didn't know that when they went on the plane from that concert to go up to San Francisco, that that was their last concert. And they had made that decision that they were going to quit touring. So, you know, I wasn't privy to that information, but there was quite a change from that short period of time. 
And then when I came to Apple, that was like a refreshing of their excitement because they had accomplished every goal that any musician or anybody could ever have. They couldn't be more number one. They couldn't be more famous. They couldn't. There was just really no more mountains to climb for them. And the idea of being businessmen and owning a large you know, corporation was really fascinating to them because they had come out you know, working class out of Liverpool. So they took an address in one of the most posh areas of London, the Mayfair district, and one of the most posh streets, uh, Sabo Row, where all the bankers and the uh, upscale tailors were. So this was a whole new life to them. And the one thing, Kelly, that I found interesting was when we started having our meetings, they had rented a suite for us just to meet in. So there's all four Beatles, myself and Stanley Gordico and Mal Evans, plus Yoko and about three Apple executives crammed in this small hotel suite for days. And boy, you know, you've seen the pictures where I'm just scrunched up between Paul and Ringo yeah. uh, in three chairs against the wall. But they came there, I don't know, almost like I make a joke, like they were wearing white polyester shirts with a plastic a pencil holder in their <laughs> their <laughs> pocket and, and their notebooks. They came very serious. They showed up on time. Uh, they asked very intelligent questions. It was just like having a, a corporate meeting with any other group of owners and things. And they were just, it was another time where there was a lot of excitement that uh, they hadn't gotten worn down with that yet. That was coming later. Isn't that you know, interesting? When Apple started becoming a problem. Now, you hear a lot of stories that make it seem like uh, in those last couple of years, like John, Paul, and George especially, were not getting along at all. But Paul has been saying recently that he's looking forward to the upcoming Peter Jackson film because it tells a different story. What was your take on the relationship between those three specifically, especially as a guy who's worked closely with so many hugely successful acts who are experiencing that level of pressure? At that time, what was your take about the relationship between those three? Well, here's what's very odd, and some people kind of go, oh yeah, you know, but every time I was with them and working with them, it was pretty uh, pretty positive. And I never saw a lot of the bad stuff. Now, it was there. I knew it was there. But the moments I spent with them was, were the moments that they were getting along and working together. And, and uh, you know, I didn't see any of the tension. I could feel the tension, but I never saw it in front of me. And the thing about the Peter Jackson film, as it's been explained to me, and as Ringo has commented, I know for sure, is he takes a very positive approach because the Michael Lindsay Hogg film, the first Let It Be film, was a dark film and did have a lot of negativity, but in Michael's, uh, Lindsay Hogg's defense, that was something that was, you know, culturally uh, acceptable in those days. It was, it was an approach people were taking, it, the black and white. And, and uh, so Peter Jackson has got a lot of footage to work with, and he has decades of technology at his disposal right now. So my understanding is that he's going to take a much lighter approach. He's got all kinds of footage to work with that has never been shown. And uh, he's really going to concentrate more on the upside of the thing, which is why Ringo and them are so happy. Ringo and Paul are so happy with what's being done because they feel that there was a side to them that didn't really get shown. And, of course, you know the media and everything would always go to the to the dirt or sure. to the, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I think they're really looking forward to that. And you worked with other bands as well, and no, most notably the Beach Boys, uh, sort of the American uh, counterpart in competition with the Beatles. I would imagine, or maybe I'm wrong, that sort of the vibe within the band under that level of pressure that they were under, maybe not unlike any one of those big bands, right? Well, you're talking about the Beach Boys? Uh, or any other big band that you've worked with, the pressures they're under uh, can lead to, you know, infighting and squabbles, and they work in close quarters together on creative things. So I think people tend to maybe fuss a little bit over the Beatles' relationships when, in your experience, maybe they were not unlike, under those circumstances, most bands with that kind of success. You know what? You've you hit the nail on the head, and not many people bring that um, truth forward. If, I've always said, and because I've worked with a lot of bands, if you want to break a band up, give them a number one record, you know, give them success because everything's okay until they start getting really big. And that's when all of a sudden they start having their own attorneys and the managers and there's all this fighting over publishing and who gets many, so that many songs. And, and the, usually the groups that break up sooner are the ones sometimes that become famous. And the Beatles were beyond any other fame, you know. So the eventual breakup, to me, 
when they did break up, it was just natural evolution. You know, it's just things bands do. They don't live in the same room, hotel room for years and stuff. Sure. You know? And fame is so destructive in the first place. Okay, let's talk about that rooftop concert. When did you find out that this thing was going to happen? Well, here's what's interesting about that is I was in L.A. and I would get a call from Mal. Then, you know, told me about the film, that the closer of the film was going to be of them doing a live concert because they hadn't done a live concert together in, I think, two years or maybe more. And so he would call me in L.A. and say that they wanted him, they wanted Mal, to scout the Sahara deserts. And they wanted me to scout the uh, southwestern deserts here to see about maybe setting up in the middle of a desert and inviting every kid and everybody in the world to come see their free concert. And there was like 30 of those ideas. So anyway, I'm, I'm included in the planning when I'm in L.A. Now I'm over in London working. It's just I would be there for that week, which is really cool that I was there that particular week when all these things happened. Right. They didn't include me in conversation, and I was in one of the offices downstairs, and I would hear some hammering going on in the building, but I just figured somebody was remodeling their office because it's a five-story building. And then all of a sudden, Mal walks in and says, uh, hey, we're going up on the roof in 15 minutes. So in answer to your question, that's when I found out that we were going to do it on the roof and when we were going to do it because it was right then. Wow. So uh, I... Uh, Going back to both California, I never worried about what time of year it was. I dressed like a Californian, very light clothes. But this happened to be the end of January. And I would get off the plane and get into a limo and go to the limo and to the hotel. And, you know, I would never be outside more than 30 seconds. So I didn't even worry about it. But now I'm going to be on this five-story building roof the end of January in downtown London. And it was cold. So I ran down the street and grabbed the first thing I could find, which was a white top coat. Wow. And I turned out to be the only person you could was wearing white up on the roof that day. So now I'm known as the man in the white coat. It's too bad you didn't beat uh, Ringo to Maureen's uh, red raincoat that he was wearing. I know. <laughs> Yeah, Ringo, well, there was three things up there against everybody else had been wearing black or really dark blue or something. And that was uh, Ringo's red coat, my white coat, and George's green pants. You know? Right. So everything else was like black. Providing a little color. You told Rolling Stone that it was just another day at the office for you, at least up until then. Uh, was there no sense at all for you that because they were set up as if for a gig, and that they had to be heard by neighbors, by fans, uh, that this was something extraordinary? Was there no sense of that at all for you? You know, when I say that uh, this was just another day at the office, people look at me like I'm daft. <laughs> but there was always so much going on with them and in that building. You never knew what was going to happen next. So um, going up there, it was just it was a needed part of the film, and I didn't think anything about it. Uh, a lot of the people in the Apple building, people that worked there all the time, didn't even know what was going on up on the roof. That's what it was. Because we couldn't have very many people up there because the roof wouldn't hold it. And they had to, the noise I told you that was happening was them building a floor, a heavy wooden floor there to support the weight of the band and the equipment. And that was just only like a, maybe a 12 by 20 section because the roof was pretty small. Yeah. But anyway, uh, no, I had no idea, had no sense. It was historical. It wasn't the kind of thing because now Yoko and I and Maureen, Ringo's wife, and Chris O'Dell, who was Peter Asher's assistant, were about four to six feet away from them, right in front of them. And we were the only people up there that didn't have a job that day. There were some people from Apple around the edges, but in that sweet spot, that's, you know, the center of the thing. Um, we were the only people up there that didn't have a job that day. So I'm sitting there, I was standing there sometime, not thinking anything about it till all of a sudden I, I did. There's something started coming over and I thought, wait a minute, something's going on here. Something's happening. And I didn't go, oh, this is the last time the Beatles are going to play together. Or, oh, they're going to be breaking up pretty soon. Or, oh, Apple's going to be all changed and everything. It just was something Something incredible is happening. I couldn't put my finger on it. And when the four of us walked, uh, the Beatles went down, and Yoko, Marie, Chris, and I walked down the stairs afterwards. Nobody said anything to each other. It was kind of like I went to my office, and you know they went to theirs, or John and Yoko probably just went and jumped in a limousine and left. But I, we couldn't couldn't put our finger on something that happened that day. And uh, 
now I know, you know. <laughs> Interesting. Now, just uh, on the way up to the roof or or even before the uh, this performance that they were going to do, what was the vibe among the guys as they were preparing to go up on the roof? Well, there's two sides of that, the part I know and the part I didn't know, uh, just how much tension there was with them at that time. And they were using an office like a dressing room before they went up on, on the roof. And uh, I was sent up to give them a message if I can't remember to George or something. And uh, when I walked in, there was a lot of tension in the room. And I thought they were just nervous about doing it. You know, I just thought it was like a band getting ready to go on mm-hmm. and didn't think, think anything about that. Cause that's what I just thought it was. I'm just, cause they hadn't played in a long time. And I was told later that well, after I left and they went up, they didn't decide to really go out on that roof. They were virtually standing at the door at the top of the stairs before they made the decision. And I guess John said something like, well, come on, let's just go do it or something like that. But uh, wow. yeah, there was, that was very close to not even happening. See, see, I would see things, but I wouldn't understand things because I wouldn't, you know, you know, you mentioned being in an inner circle. I was in one of the inner circles, but there are many levels of inner circles. Sure. And, uh, but when you're in one of the inner circles, you were in. You know? Yeah. You know, it's a, it's amazing. It's kind of a road not taken kind of thing, right? I mean, how close it was to yeah. not actually happening. And here's we have this legendary oh. moment. And also the fact that they did a phenomenal concert. Um, the favorite part. Well, do you want me to wait to talk about the roof, or are we are we almost there? On the uh, no, I've got a few more here, but I think we'll we'll let's see okay. if we get to it. We'll put a pin in that one. So once they got playing, did they seem to be having a good time to you? In other words, did all the other stuff just seem to fall away in favor of the fun of just playing music together again? That's just what I was going to talk to you about. <laughs> is the fact that uh, when they came up uh, and they started playing. And this is the thing that really, probably my most memorable moment in the music business, as, and as part of the roof, the most memorable thing was when they started playing, because there was so much going down on every level. I mean, there was just really so much dissension and tension and all these things. But when they started playing, something happened. And and I'm sitting just a few feet away, and George looked over, I mean, Paul looked over at John, or John looked over at Paul, and there was a look in their eyes like, yeah, this is us. You know, we start out as a great live band, and we're still a good live band, and we've been mates for all this time. We've shared success and things like nobody else did, and so this this is us. And they just played, and they played just like I, they probably played in the cavern. You know, they just really – and, you know, you've seen this thing. They were, you know, making comments back and forth. John was saying funny little things. and Yeah and stuff, but they were just started having a good time. And here's, for me, I wrote this in the book, and to me, as an author, it's my seventh book, is one of my favorite lines of all time is, I wrote in it, they came up on the roof without a sound check, they went back down those stairs with a soul check. And I think they needed that moment together. I think they needed to touch on each other at that level again so after all have been through and uh i just think it was something that they needed to feel one more time and that was the last time that they played together so i think that was important and i also think maybe that really had a lot to do with them being able to do abbey road i was just going to say because uh, abbey road was the uh last album recorded even though let it be was the last one released and abbey road considered to be a far superior album with kind of a a new spirit to the band i was just going to ask you about that that's interesting yeah well it, it was to me it was an, a Beatle record because they'd <clears throat> gone through uh, the white album uh, and then the let it be sessions and there was a lot of you know one person at a time just a lot of individual things and in uh, abbey road they came back together as a band and that's why uh, i'm this is blasphemy i know to the Beatles fan <laughs> but the white album isn't my favorite album that's the album i was i was most involved with in you know yeah. and let it be those, those are my maybe my two least favorite albums in a way compared to when they were doing the revolvers and rubber soul and, and abbey road and all the other things you know i don't know there was something in Abbey Road that brought all that original stuff back. Sure. Yeah. I understand that uh, you were George's uh, hand-warming tech on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm curious about, I've never seen a picture of that. And I understand that the Peter Jackson thing, he's got uh, 
I forget how many hours in footage of film. I think 50. Somebody, yeah, and somebody told me the, the whole 42 minutes, he might even be showing that. But I would like to see that again because I've never, you know, I've never had a picture of it. It was a real quick moment in time. And, uh, you, you know, you tell these stories sometimes. But then if you don't have a proof, and when it comes to something like the Beatles, you feel like you have to validate everything. And when I had told more than once the fact that I was in the Let It Be sessions down in the basement of Apple, but I had no proof of that because the cameras were never rolling when I was down there. Yeah. And there's this famous Beatle historian uh, about a month ago has got the tapes from down in the basement of Apple, and he sent me a little clip. He said, thought you might like this, and then you can hear it go. I come in the studio, and Paul says, hey, Ken, how you, when did you get here, man? You know, welcome to bloody England. And it was just so neat. To, okay, now, yeah, you know, I got proof. <laughs> as far as up on the roof, for the fans that don't know that story, how are you helping George on the roof with his hands? Well, it was cold. John Lennon was having a serious problem with the cold and being able to, you know, the fingers to play in the strings. And George just uh, asked me to light a couple of cigarettes between my fingers, and he put his tips of his fingers, uh, got, you know, up close to the cold just so he could warm them up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. So it wasn't like I was a cigarette roadie for the day. It was just it's just something that happened real quick. You know what? I would I would put that on your resume right now that you were cigarette roadie for the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Except it doesn't pay well, so Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Just a couple more here. Uh, you've, of course, written about the day, and your very successful career continued on from there. Now, all these years later, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you when you think of that day on the roof? Um, how um, cold it was, first of all. <laughs> how ironic that the four of us, Yoko, myself, Maureen, and Chris, were up there. As the, Like I said, we were the audience. I tell people, yeah, we were the only audience up there, and, and our seats were comped. You know, yeah. but how I got to be up there, and I know how I got to be up there, it was just Mal Evans. Mal Evans just always really was, we just had a great relationship, so he wanted me to share it. And maybe even one of the Beatles wanted me to see it, too, because they knew that I was running the company in America, and it was important that I'd be enthused about things and maybe have some special insights to things when I go back to California and start promoting things and putting things together for them. But yeah. uh, it's just the fact that I was up there, I was clueless of being anything. Um, and then as I look back, it's almost like um, I'm watching a movie that I'm in, but I, I guess they're like, was I there? You know? I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Now, we, I've, I've seen pictures of you huddled up against that wall with Yoko and, and Maureen Starkey, Ringo's wife. I wanted to ask about Yoko because there you are with her, sitting with her, and you must have gotten to know her a little bit. To fans, she's a bit of an enigma. And I know that to a lot of Beatles fans, uh, they were put off when she was in the studio. Well, she was literally joined at the hip with uh, John and sometimes offering musical advice in the studio. And I, I think that's, or I know that's been off-putting to a lot of fans. Is she misunderstood? Um, if you, if I, if there was a definite yes and no answer, no other answer i would say yes um she it was strange because when you met the four beatles you know before yoko came on the scene it was one thing but the minute she came there it was uncomfortable for everybody mm. she i used to say also she could do more of being silent and quiet than anybody else should say more of that because she was just there and there's a while before she started voicing you know suggestions and stuff like that but it was a, you know, I'm not talking out of school on this and how Paul felt about it and George and everything. It was a problem. And people say that, well, Yoko broke up the Beatles. Well, I think they're giving her way too much credit because, like I said earlier, there were just things that, you know, groups do break up. And she was a contributing factor. I mean, she wasn't something that was a glue that held them together. But uh, she was, um, now, like you said, I was sitting next to her on the roof. I don't know if we said three words worked together while we were up there. She was very uh, gracious to me in the fact that she approved things for me later on that I, you know, needed John's approval after he passed away. And so she, you know, she was very good to me in that respect. Sure. So I have nothing to say, but uh, it was, it was strange. Uh, she made me feel uncomfortable. Like I wasn't good enough. For, she just had that something 
Well, I think you know what I'm trying to say. Sure, yeah, exactly. Are you still in touch with Paul and Ringo? And if so, do you have a sense of what their memory today is of that day on the rooftop? I don't. Um, I'm, of course, Ringo and I stayed together for a couple of decades afterwards because he lived in L.A. I represented him later on in the 90s, and we shared the same attorney for decades. But uh, we just, you know, faded away from each other. I, be, you know, I moved on. I became an author. I became a, a minister for years, and we just our worlds just changed so much. But we, every once in a while, there would be notes passed back and forth. Somebody would say, "Yeah, I was at a Paul concert and got to meet Paul and told him I knew you," and he mm-hmm. said, "Be sure and tell me." You know that kind of stuff. But no, totally out of contact with him. Ringo, um, that's just been a few years, a few years, but uh, Paul, I haven't seen him hardly at all since then. And ha- do you have a sense of, uh, if you were to ask Ringo today, what his memory of the day on the roof would be? Well, I know he, he was the one, I think, that uh, got to be the observer in the band, because he was sitting there, and uh, he had made comments about he was really watching, because there's no audience. We couldn't see the people down on the street, and they couldn't see us. But there was an audience that developed on the fire escapes and building ledges and mm-hmm. all these things. Ringo, I think, was sitting back there just in the groove, and uh, he was sitting right close to Billy Preston. And that was, you know, and I, he uh, made the comment once that he was kind of got to see the <laughs> observe the scene from where he was. So he, he didn't he didn't have to work maybe as hard as the rest of them did. Last question: The Beatles break up is, I think, seen as part of that series of events in the late 60s that signaled the end of the innocence of the idealism of the hippie movement, along with the 1968 assassinations, Vietnam, the Manson murders, Altamont, all of that. Now, you were with the Beatles during that time that a lot of fans think of as bittersweet because of the infighting. So my question is, do you have a favorite happy memory from that time that you can share? Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is very strange because uh, when you taught asking that, I'd have to think, oh, this, 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 or this, but something always comes to my mind. And it was just the nature of how, how courteous they were. You know, they, they were brought up working class in Liverpool, and they were taught manners because they were very courteous. They were very respectful. And uh, I had been called into London, and i have been on the road. I think it was down in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and I had to get to London. I got called and had to go to London. I hadn't slept all night. And uh, I get there at evening, London time, and go right straight to the building upstairs, and there's a, something to do with the Magical Mystery Tour. And I get upstairs, and they're there, and all of a sudden I thought I was going to get sick because I was so tired, and I was leaning against the desk. And George comes over and says, hey, Ken, when did you get here? And I went, blah, blah, blah. Cause I, just, I started mumbling. I thought I was going to throw up. You know, and he said, uh, where are you staying? You know, and uh, the, he just looked at me. And after about a couple of questions like that, he, he could tell what was happening. He said, that, come on, man, we're out of here. And uh, he took me to the hotel and burst it, got me in the hotel up to my room and probably took my shoes off or something, made sure I was okay. But um, he said, you know, don't worry, man. Uh, the meetings tomorrow, you come in when you feel like it and I'll cover for you because he knew the pressure I was in and he knew I, I couldn't make any mistakes and I had to be young. Know, he just knew it. And so he, uh, he was just a, a friend. <laughs> it seemed like, and that's the things like that that I remember the most are the really small detailed personal things you know, that happened. That's a great place to leave it. He was the man in the yeah. white coat up on the roof that day, Ken Mansfield, multi-hyphenate, and the author of The Roof, the Beatles' final concert, available on Amazon. You've got so many stories to tell. Thanks for doing this, and I hope we can chat again sometime about the other parts of your career in music. Thanks so much, Ken. Well, thank you for inviting me.